Hello everyone and welcome to another Top 25. My name is Will Ryan and, and JT! Ow! It, you fixed your door. You couldn't open it. And I'm JT Camp! Dude, move over. Come on. <laughs> You know, it's about time you finally managed to show up to one of these. What took you so long? It's not my fault you never invited me. Well, it's not my fault you're never available. Well, it's not my fault I have a full-time job. Well, it's not my fault I don't have a full-time job. Oh. I made myself sad. And anyway, today we're looking at- Top, top 25 best movies. Let's do it. That's not the list. Over the last couple weeks, we looked at 25 anime you would not want to waste your time on, and 25 that you can't possibly miss. But today, we're doing something a little bit different. Yeah, you know, anime series are great and all, but movies really bring a little something extra to the table. You know, you've got bigger budgets, visionary directors, some of the most talented artists in the business. I mean, yep. they really shine. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, and? Well, a lot of them suck too. I mean, have you seen Appleseed? We love nothing more than celebrating great accomplishments in anime films, so today we're gonna do just that. Now, you're not really gonna find any secret or obscure films on the list, but that's not the point. The point is, we want to show you the very best. That's right, but we did make one caveat for this list, and that is, no director can have more than two films on it. We did this because a straight up unlimited top 25 would be a waste of your time. And I'll tell you why. There's one sentence I can give to you that would accomplish the same thing as 20 plus minutes of a list like that. Watch Miyazaki films. All of them. Well, I mean, except Howl's Moving Castle, right? That one was kind of shit. The point is, we want to celebrate as many great anime films as possible from a wide variety of people, and it's kind of hard to do that when your list is dominated by seven or eight Miyazaki movies or seven or eight other films by Mamoru Hosoda and Satoshi Kon. So why would you even bother at that point, right? I mean... Here's the thing. Will and I spent about the better part of a week nailing this list down as appropriately as we could. So. If you find that one of your most cherished movies is a little bit lower than you'd expect, please don't lose your mind. The fact that it made it at all onto this extremely competitive list is reason enough to show that we respect it just as much as you do. Exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself. So let's do this. These are the top 25 anime films that you must see. Oh my god. What did I say at the beginning? I say like top 25 best movies? Yeah. I really sailed the train on that one. Oops. Well, you're not the first one. Let's go! Number 25. Street Fighter II, the animated movie. So, JT, since this one was all your idea, why don't you tell everyone why it belongs on this list at all? Sure, I'd be happy to. Oh, oh, yeah! What the hell? <laughs> I love the Street Fighter games ever since I was a kid, and over the past many, many years, they've really done a lot of crappy adaptations. But in 1994, they actually managed to do something right with it. Sure, Street Fighter 2 isn't exactly a masterpiece, and it doesn't do anything crazy, but holy shit, if the fight scenes aren't crazy awesome. The plot is also shockingly competent and finds ways to feature, big surprise, as much fighting as possible without really feeling like there's all there is to it. 
It's a fairly standard story about the most iconic Street Fighter characters uniting to stop M. Bison. And there are several hilarious moments involving the big villain's new cyborg army, like this guy. Thug Jesus? Did clothes like this actually exist? And why is this guy dressed like a fireman? Was he created to lead a robot tribute band for the village people? It's fun to stay at the YMCA. It's fun to stay at the YMCA. Actually, though, I find it kind of hard to really kick this film down. It does a lot of things very well, and it's definitely the best adaptation of a fighting game, so yeah, why not include it? Especially for those sweet Chun Li boobs. Really, dude? Come on. Um, uh, what I meant to say was. Especially for more of that sweet Chun Li ass. <sighs> My god, what are you doing to me? I'm not gonna pretend I don't have a sex drive. I mean, hell, this movie practically invented the shameless shower scene. I'm not gonna pretend it's not there. Well, alright, fine. But can you keep it to a minimum? And Time for more sweet ass. Oh, Jesus Christ. Number 24. Five centimeters per second. Well... Hello, JT. Wanna, wanna talk about some uh, some grade school girls? Maybe some Shut up! Okay, then I guess it's my turn. Makoto Shinkai has spent many years since the place promised in our early days, experimenting with various forms of storytelling and narratives, often, unfortunately, to the detriment of his productions. You can tell his goal is to emotionally reach his audience, but until very recently he seemed to always fall just a little bit short due to focusing too much on visual storytelling. However, for his second film, he did truly manage to accomplish something touching. Five centimeters per second tells the story of a boy and a girl who become close as children and develop feelings for each other as they start to grow up, but are ultimately forced apart. The majority of the film deals with what happens to them after their parting, and while it is certainly not a happy experience, it does make you feel something. And that something is melancholy. And heartache. No, they're not comfortable feelings, but Makoto accomplishes the task of conveying them to you nonetheless. Unfortunately, this film suffers from a disappointingly short runtime, something that keeps it from true greatness, as the 63 minutes it does put forth leave you feeling unresolved. Like, the film should have gone on even further. Despite this, it definitely deserves a watch, and if you've become a fan of his due to another entry yet to come, you owe it to yourself to see what Shinkai can do with much less happy subject matter. Just don't blame us if you feel unhappy at the end. That's, uh, that's really not our fault. Number 23. Cowboy Bebop The Movie. Cowboy Bebop is so awesome, isn't it? I've never seen a show be so cool, so self-assured, and still manage to actually perfectly pull off what it does so well. I mean, they literally made this series with the intent of it being one of the best of all time. Who even does that? Smart people, that's who. Yeah. Smart people like Shinichiro Watanabe, who went on to do Samurai Shampoo and Space Dance. Smart people like Yoko Kano, one of the best anime music writers of all time, who formed her own jazz band, The Seatbelts, just to write the musical score, and then went on tour because they became so popular. Hey, Will. What? Jesus Christ. Bring it down a couple notches, man. Oh, oh sorry. I thought we were doing a thing. What if the entire cast and crew of Cowboy Bebop got together to do another movie and it was just as fun and exciting as the series? That would be awesome! Jesus, you're gonna blow out the fucking mic! Oh, I'm sorry. I... Cowboy Bebop knocking on heaven's door! You dick. Cowboy Bebop knocking on heaven's door arrived on September 1st of 2001 with a story about terrorism being committed by a military dissident using a truck bomb. Unfortunately, 10 short days later, the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center would remind everyone of the fact that Osama Bin Laden tried to first attack the World Trade Center with, you guessed it, truck bombs. I guess critics at the time just couldn't uncloud their judgment as the film received several negative reviews because of it. That seems a tad inappropriate, don't you think? Probably, because Cowboy Bebop the movie is basically the same thing as a longer episode of the series. 
It tells a much more expansive, big scale story as the familiar crew go after the largest bounty ever handed out to a criminal. Spike does enjoy a lot of extra characterization and depth, but unfortunately, to the film's detriment, none of the remaining cast receives anywhere near as much attention. It is still a great ride for fans of the series though, serving up both happy moments and significantly darker ones, much like Watanabe did throughout his first 26 episodes. Basically, if you don't go in expecting the moon, you'll enjoy yourself just fine. Just like we did. Give it a shot! Number 22, Ayakashi, Goblin Cat. I already mentioned this entry in the last Top 25 video when I was introducing Mononoke, but I had to add it here as well because it's just so damn good. Sure, it, it must be. Wait, did you not actually watch this? No, I didn't remember full-time job. What the f no problem, JT! I'll take it from here! This is Ayakashi, Goblin Cat. You suck. While Mononoke can focus far more on mystery than horror, Goblin Cat, the first outing for the iconic medicine seller, is distinctly the latter. From the very beginning, a mood of seeping dread permeates the story. The tension never lets up and it leaves you on the edge of your seat the entire time as you try to unravel the mystery of what is plaguing these people and where it came from. At just over an hour, it doesn't outstay its welcome and confidently delivers one of the most solid horror experiences I've seen in a film. So, why is it so low on this list? Frankly, as much as I love the art style of Mononoke, it does become a bit distracting in this film. It starts to get in the way of the storytelling and overstep its bounds, but luckily it eventually does get reined in and doesn't trample. If you're going to see Mononoke, I would definitely recommend seeing this film first. It's definitely worth your time. Ahem. <clears throat> Yeah, okay, fine, I'll watch the movie. I was going to anyway. Number 21, Neo Tokyo. So, uh, you're on board for this one, right, JT? Oh, come on, you've got to yes, be kidding me. Yes, of course I am. Calm your tits. Don't touch them. Anyway, take it away then. Don't mind if I do. Neo Tokyo is a meeting of the minds for Astro Boy's Rintaro, Ninja Scroll's Yoshiaki Kawajira, and Akira's Katsuhiro Otomo to create a truly special anthology film with their greatest talents on display. The idea was all Rintaro's, so his portion of the film, Labyrinth, bookends the other two. It's... well... it's certainly something. Dude. 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 I am so hot right now, bro. Me too, dude. I am having the craziest hallucinations, man. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, man. It's like, like, are we just, are we just watching a movie or something? Like, what? No way, bro. It's. The other two in the trilogy are much more straightforward and really do show what talented artists and creative minds their authors are. Unfortunately, as cool as it can be, an anthology film will never rank as high for me as a truly great film with one complete overarching narrative, so it finds itself here at number 21. Still, search this one out to see more of what some of the most iconic anime directors can do unleashed. Number 20, Vampire Hunter D. Whatever happened to vampires? Twilight. <sighs> yeah, that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? Yup. Anyway, before Helsing came around, vampires were already hard at work being awesome with one of the first anime movies to make a big splash in the American anime community. As you would probably expect, this movie is all about the D.
You are way more proud of that joke than you have any right to be. Yep. Well before the film, and even continuing today, Vampire Hunter D is originally a series of 26 novels written by Hideyuki Kikuchi, who also penned the original Wicked City. The first film adaptation that we bring to you today is based on the first in that line, also titled Vampire Hunter D. It catalogs the first hunt for the D as he looks to protect a girl from the evil vampire Count Lee and his group of monstrous minions. What really sets this film apart, and what did at the time as well, is its use of darkness. A lot of the film is completely in the dark, and it uses this both to set an oppressive mood and make D into a force to be reckoned with. A lot can be said in film with negative space, but the darkness here almost takes on a life of its own as you never really know what might come out of it next. It obviously fits, given that the story is about vampires, but that's true with any film in the genre, and few of them have stood the test of the time as well as D has. With the novel series so rich with source material, a brand new CGI Vampire Hunter D anime, a la Berserk, has been announced and is currently in production. Funimation recently re-released this film after years and years in the out-of-print heap, so there's never been a better time than now to find your own taste for... Don't say it. The D. Number 19. Ghost in the Shell. You know, Will, I've heard you bringing up Blade Runner a lot recently, but I've never really heard you say anything about Ghost in the Shell. What's the matter? Do you hate Ghost in the Shell? Yes. Oh. All joking aside, Ghost in the Shell may very well be one of the most important anime films here in the West. It further solidified the foothold that adult anime films had gained, and proved even further that intelligent, thought-provoking stories could be told through an animated medium. The story follows the iconic Major Kusanagi, as she chases down a hacker known as the Puppet Master, who is hacking various ghosts at will and rewriting them. We won't say any more at the risk of spoiling the story, but needless to say, Ghost in the Shell has far more going on than that. It takes Blade Runner's fundamental question of what makes us human and takes it one step further by asking, what is life? Now, I know that sounds pretentious as all hell, but when you're talking about man, machine, and the combination of both, it's a profound question definitely worthy of exploration. So, why is it this low on the list, many of you might be wondering? Well... Honestly, there's just no humanity to it. It is a landmark film with incredible animation and genuinely thought-provoking commentary, but there's no real heart anywhere in it. There are no human characters worthy of focus, so it truly misses out in that regard. Either way though, it made this list for several reasons, and all of them make it worthy. If you somehow haven't seen this film, definitely seek it out today. Its hype is real. Number 18, Ninja Scroll. Hey, Will! Have you ever been to the countryside in Japan? No, JT, as you are well aware, I have sadly never been to Japan. Well, I have, and I gotta tell you, it was kind of weird, you know? I'm driving my car down the road and I keep getting stopped by all these guys with swords. They kept demanding me to pay them! Like it was some kind of ninja toll! I swear to god, if you start this pun shit oh, again- Oh, what are you gonna do? You're gonna slice me up and eat me out of a ninja bowl? Let's just talk about the movie already. This film needs no introduction. When you ask a hardcore anime fan where you should start, Ninja Scroll will be one of the first things they say to you. 9 times out of 10. And of course, it's well deserved. Incredible animation, ultraviolence, old school badassery. Ninja Scroll is the purest embodiment of Yoshiaki Kawajiri's artistic sensibilities and the 90s pulp anime scene as a whole. Film premises don't get much simpler either. Samurai kills Despot, Despot comes back from the dead and wants revenge. Fights occur. I mean, there is more to it than that, but none of it's as important as the kick-ass fight scenes. Seriously, they're freaking awesome. Oh, 
The primary issue with the film is that it is so entrenched in 90s exploitation that it fails to really rise above that. Granted, for what it wants to accomplish, it doesn't need to do more than that, but it definitely gets seated lower than films that genuinely aspire for more. Still though, it's super kick-ass and always worth a watch. Hell, maybe I'll go watch it again when we're done here. Ooh, can I come too? No. Oh, come on, don't be such a ninja troll. That one didn't even make any sense. Damn, he's right. Hmm. Oh, well, next time I'll get him. And with five puns. That'll be my ninja goal. Next film. I hate you more every day. Number 17, Metropolis. Do you like Astro Boy? Do you want to see what a world would be like where every single person is drawn like him? Yeah, and can it be super violent and dark too? Sure, why not? And let's slap a jazz soundtrack over it and call it Metropolis. Hooray! Wait, what? Metropolis is what happens when period pieces are simultaneously very faithful and not faithful at all. What the holy hell does that mean? Well, the film is steampunk noir to its core. From the screen transitions to the score, the world design, the color scheme, everything is as on the money as you can get. But then there's all sorts of weird biblical imagery, Tower of Babel commentary, and really bad CGI. I mean, what? I can't say almost anything about the story without spoiling something because it is quite complicated and operating on numerous levels, but the scale of the film and the intricate design of its world are utterly fantastic. I love the neon everywhere and all these stylistic touches, all the detail. Hell, the English dub is even good. The one thing ironically dragging down the film is that it gets too big for its own good. The characters and story just aren't enough to spread over its vast canvas and that does weaken it to a certain degree. Oh shut up Will you ignorant slut. The film's artistic accomplishments and overall visual splendor more than make up for the just okay story and somewhat standard characters. If you're looking for something truly from another era, then Metropolis should be your first stop. Unless you're from Japan, then this movie might happen to you. I'm from Japan. My name is Junsaku Bai. I'm a private detective. Oh, if only they'd known. Number 16, Whisper of the Heart. This is the least funny thing you've ever done. Shh. I'm trying to hear the whisper of the Oh, heart. don't uh, even dare! Uh, Would you quit it with the puns already? Don't you have any other material? No, I don't. Oh, I'm glad you brought your A-game. Mm. Anyway, this is Whisper of the Heart. Whisper of the Heart is a lesser-known Ghibli film not directed by Miyazaki, but still lacks none of that trademark charm and heart. It centers around Shizuku Tsukishima, a young girl from Tokyo who discovers that someone else is reading the same books as her and stumbles into a wonderful experience she never knew she could have. Along the way, she meets several interesting characters and forms bonds in one of the most humble stories to come out of Ghibli. It's impressive that the small scope of the story and unremarkable quality of the film's events don't detract from how eye-catching and engrossing it can be. Whisper of the Heart is a near-perfect title because it's heartwarming to a degree almost on the level of Miyazaki's films. However, because the film is so intimate and small, I simply couldn't put it higher than the movies to come, even though you should definitely seek it out if you haven't already. It's authentically beautiful and touching while never tripping into silly, schmaltzy territory. When you're stuck smiling as the credits roll, you'll thank us. Number 15, Sword of the Stranger. Yup, again. But how could we not? I mean, this one's an all-time great, even if it isn't perfect. What more can we say? Actually, I don't know. I think I said everything I had to say last time. Uh, go watch it? Seriously? That's it? Well, I mean, I... 
I guess I could copy the entire last entry from the last top 25 video and just throw it in here. Are you serious? That's so lazy. This film doesn't try to do anything wild that rocks the boat, instead settling for the typical tale of a wandering ronin dragged into a heroic journey to save a child. What it does best, however, is just about everything else. It hosts one of the greatest film scores of all time and includes what can unequivocally be called the greatest animated sword fight ever. The rest of the film has a few exciting sequences, but can drag on for a bit in the middle as it cuts back and forth between several characters that don't particularly matter until the very end. This can bore some and definitely hurts the overall quality of the film, but the rest of its virtues and peerless accomplishments more than make up for it. If you want a simple tale of stoic heroism and some of the most exciting anime action you've ever seen, or if you just love this genre as much as I do, you can't miss this one. Luckily, Funimation finally released the film earlier this year, and it can both be found on Amazon.com and streamed on the Funimation website. Happy viewing, everyone. <sighs> I think you're the one that's prouder than you should be this time. Too bad. Next. Number 14, Redline. Speaking of non-existent segues, it's time for something completely different in all of the best ways possible. Redline isn't just a film. It's a rare experience we'll probably never get again. And it kicks so much ass! Over the course of seven painstaking years, the Redline crew at Madhouse meticulously crafted Redline's 100,000 frames by hand. I don't know if you're aware, but anime are not made that way anymore. The production isn't the only thing that's a throwback either. I mean, look at all these freakish robots, aliens, and monsters. Look at the insane over-the-top car designs and how gloriously ridiculous they all are. The plot is about an illegal race on a planet populated by robots who wage war on the racers because no one has permission to be there. If I didn't know any better, I'd swear this came straight from the 90s in a time machine. We did a full review of this action fest at the beginning of An America Season 3, but it absolutely had to be on this list. From the feel of the film, to its high-octane story and pacing, to its outrageously bright color scheme and constantly blaring engines, everything fits. Absolutely everything. The only thing that puts it here on the list is that the film is, admittedly, somewhat lacking in substance. It's a crazy thrill ride with all the excitement you can handle and more. It does also have a surprising amount of character development and plot, but it's not particularly profound or moving because that's not what the film is going for. Regardless, if you haven't seen Redline, you don't know what you're missing. Number 13, Berserk, The Golden Age. I am so happy that we finally get to talk about Berserk. It's my turn. Fuck off, you cannot be serious. Yes, I'm completely serious. I'm the one that introduced you to these movies in the first place. I get to intro them. Okay, fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Back in 1997... Berserk is awesome! How do you like it? In 1997, we got a Berserk anime. That never went anywhere, and we still don't know why. Maybe OLM is too focused on Pokemon to give a shit, but I guess the real answer is anyone's guess. Regardless, in 2012, Studio 4C invoked a do-over clause that I just made up, and released the first in a three-film series retelling the Golden Age arc from the manga. It's basically the same material that went into the original anime, but because the story is on a film budget, the art and animation are on another level. Man, blood and violence haven't been this satisfying in a while. I don't want to spoil any of its greatness, but the basic premise centers around Guts, an aimless sellsword who gets roped into the Band of the Hawk by their charismatic leader Griffith. Guts turns out to be a badass among boys and quickly becomes one of the most awesome fighters in anime history. Where the story goes from there, you'll have to find out for yourself. The films were so successful that they earned a brand new anime series that finally expands the Berserk anime venture into the Black Swordsman arc. Thank God. 
For the uninitiated, I should warn you about the third film. Yeah, this one, The Advent. I mean, look at the fucking cover. You think anything happy or fun happens in this movie? I didn't think so. Just brace yourself before you hit play. Now go slay some demons already, they're waiting! Number 12. Millennium Actress. Well, I uh, already did this one too, so well, excuse me, I'll just grab this clip here real no, quick. No, you can't! You can't do oh, fuck! What is going on here? All right, look. I know that the last entry in a trilogy usually has some retreaded ground and all that, but this is the first one I've been here for. You can't just copy and paste everything. Okay, fine. You know what? If you've got something to say about Millennium Actress, go ahead and say it. I don't know what else I could possibly contribute. Okay, I will. Good. Most love stories these days are cookie cutter rom-coms with no desire for creativity because why bother? They make their pre-sold female audience money and that's all they care about. However, Satoshi Kon never did anything half-assed. The man was incapable of using anything less than his full ass. Why are you focusing so hard on a dead man's ass? Shut up. Millennium Actress follows one of the most unorthodox love stories ever made, an unresolved pursuit. At face value, this sounds like a pointless exercise, but it ends up being one of the most touching and heartbreaking films of all time, not just in anime. The variety of settings and art are stunning. The constant switches between reality and film call back to perfect blue, but the goal here is not to disturb, it's to put us right in the girl's position. She would come close to finding him, but then she had to go to her next film and follow him once again. Then she'd get close yet again, only to have to pursue another film and chase him down further and repeat. You can feel the very real frustration she must have felt with every delay, but you also feel her joy when she continues to find breadcrumbs pushing her further and forward. If there can be one thing to criticize about the film, and I question the validity of this criticism, it's that the film's format gets fairly repetitive over the course of its runtime. However, that also amplifies the emotional impact of the repeated disappointments and helps us better feel for our female protagonist, so not sure if it's really something to shit on. Regardless, this is definitely one of the greatest anime films of all time and would have been even higher on this list were it not for... Number 11. The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. Mamoru Hosoda. Hosoda? Constantly defying everyone's expectations. That's right. You know, it's strange that so many other directors get so much more attention than him, considering that his recent resume is one of the best in the current anime film scene, and his lead directing career could not have kicked off any better than it did with The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. Actually, his first movie was Digimon. We don't talk about that one. I think we can all agree that at this point, Time travel really isn't good enough on its own for a story anymore. I mean, the idea first popped up over 120 years ago with the time machine, and even then, that wasn't the primary focus of the story. Steinsgate used it as a device to explore concepts like responsibility and the dangers of unintended consequences, while the film at hand today uses it to explore numerous facets of youth and truths about the human condition. Holy shit, I love this movie. When Makoto Kano stumbles upon the ability to literally leap back in time, she immediately assumes it's just a thing she can do now, forever. This plot point alone is a fitting commentary on how teenagers most commonly look at time. Never and forever. The question of how long she'll have to treasure this experience never occurs to her because it's not a perspective she has. Kind of like a dog. This is reflected in several of her later comments about how she always believed her friendship with Chiake and Kosuke would last forever. Since the film is about time though, it does end up showing her how fleeting everything can truly be. This may only be one dimension of the film, but I don't want to start getting into actual spoiler territory, so I'll have to stop there. 
Just make sure you see this one if you haven't already. Well, I don't care about spoilers. Fuck you. Chia no! Oh, why is it always a slap? Would you prefer a frying pan instead? No. Well, all right then. Anyway, guys, it's time for the top 10 again. Well, this time we're going to spend a little more time on these entries because as far as we're concerned, they really are in the top tier of anime films, period. That's right. So, without further ado, these mm -hmm. are the top 10 best anime films you have to see. Why isn't it doing the fade to black thing? Well, because I'm the one editing it. Fuck yourself. Thanks, future me. Anyway, these are the top 10 anime films you must see. Oh yeah. You are such a cunt. Mm -hmm. Number 10, Grave of the Fireflies. Hey, JT, no. Wanna watch a movie about two kids being depressed and slowly dying? No. But it's one of the best anime films of all time. No. Okay. I guess I'll tell everyone about it then. No, it's my turn. Okay. Go ahead. No. <sighs> Grave of the Fireflies is overall a crushing film. At the very least, they tell you right up front that both of our main characters die. You have no illusions two minutes in about how this is going to go, and you know what? If you want to get out right then and there, you'd know exactly why you'd want to. However, the film itself is far more complex than that. It pulls no punches as a critique of Japanese society as a whole, something that frankly we don't get to see very often when we're not talking about samurai raping women. The film follows Seita and his four-year-old sister Setsuko, who are stranded in the midst of World War II when their mother dies tragically while their father is away fighting in the Navy. They think things will start getting better when they go to live with their aunt, but instead she slowly becomes cold to them, eventually suggesting that Seita should just go off to war himself. Because sure, abandoning his sister clearly seems like a viable option. The two end up homeless, and while they briefly find happiness, it all deteriorates as an indifferent society of people solely focused on their own self-preservation take no vested interest in helping them survive. In all honesty, the film perfectly accomplishes what it wants to. You feel their happiness, but you also mire in their melancholy, desperation, and grief, which is the major focus of the film. Whether you want to watch this film entirely depends on if you're ready for negative emotions like that, but there's no arguing that Grave of the Fireflies is one of the most important war films of all time and an anime film worthy of being in the top 10. When you do eventually decide to enter the movie's gauntlet, you will not regret that you did. Number 9. Evangelion 2. You Cannot Advance. But Will, you hate Evangelion. Yes, I do. It bored me to tears and constantly pissed me off when I watched it, but I'm not unreasonable. The first Evangelion movie did a great job of reintroducing a story I couldn't stand to suffer through in a way that genuinely gripped me, and this second film is by far one of the best anime films I've ever seen. Definitely. Now if you could just stop being such a little bitch about an iconic story- Not a chance. Wow. It's an audacious effort to completely reinvent a story, but when that story was directed by a hack and ended so poorly that it required three tries to do it correctly, and still failed, sometimes turning and burning really is your best option. Enter the Evangelion Rebuild, which, for two entries at least, did a great job of doing something risky, exciting, and new. Evangelion 2 diverges heavily, focusing on Shinji's relationship with Rei alongside the series' standard introduction of Asuka and her powerful new Eva unit. There's brutality and emotional wreckage aplenty, and, in all honesty, the film does reach a pinnacle of achievement that the series never really could. 
This is another one that's really hard to discuss without going into spoiler territory, but needless to say, when you make Shinji and Rei the heart of your film, you've done something right. Focusing on philosophical rants and artistic abstraction would not have improved anything. This film's crew finally figured out what you have to do to achieve true greatness, and I am proud to say that I could not be more pleased. Now enjoy Rei in a bikini. What? Why? <laughs> because anime fans love their underage girls. Ugh, fine, I guess you win this round. Number eight, Colorful. Wow, seriously, this is our number eight? <laughs> You're a lot freakier than I thought. No, you don't get to have this one. That's your anime, not mine. Obviously, this isn't about panties. Instead, it's about one of the most profound commentaries on the human condition to ever come from all of anime. I'm talking, of course, about the real colorful. This one's real too. No, it's not. But it came out first. No, it didn't. Colorful begins with a nameless soul who is given a second chance at life, but only if he passes a significant challenge. He is dropped into the body of 14-year-old Makoto Kobayashi, who has just committed suicide by drug overdose, and tasked both with finding out all the specific reasons why Makoto killed himself, along with what his great sin was in his past life. He is given six months to do both of these things or he will be sent back to limbo for all eternity. The film immediately becomes depressingly dark as this new Makoto starts to investigate the events that supposedly led to old Makoto's suicide and discovers a very real dark side of humanity. I mainly want you to be ready for this portion of the film as the title would seem to imply something happier and sweeter. However, as Will initially said, that's not what this film is truly about. Colorful is an examination of the human condition, an expose on what the word even means. Smashing the traditional ideas of good and bad, the film paints a far more nuanced portrait of individual people, each having their own faults alongside the things that make them lovable. But this isn't just a journey the main character is taking, Colorful is not content with a passive experience for its audience. You're not getting off that easy. Instead, the film demands that you, the audience, also wrestle with this truth. It portrays Makoto in exactly the same light. At various times, he is awful and destructive, happy and carefree, selfish and cold, loving and warm. They're all different facets of his character that are seemingly contradictory to each other, but hey, that's humanity. If you want to be intellectually challenged by a film that might genuinely make you feel uncomfortable about how simplistically you may view people and the world, I recommend this film to you. In fact, I demand that you see it. In our modern world where every person is defined day to day in stark black and white by numerous people who oppose them, Colorful stands in opposition to that very approach and expects a hell of a lot more from you. And frankly, it's never been more important than it is right now. You owe this one to yourself. So please, don't miss this absolute treasure. Number 7. Summer Wars So, Will! Mm -hmm. Do you remember back when you reviewed Summer Wars in Ant America Season 2? Uh, yeah, of course! Link's in the description. <laughs> oh, Will, stop your shameless self-promotion. You sure are being a summer whore. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> Get over here, you fuck! Summer Wars is our second Hosoda... Hosoda? ...film on the list, and it sits this high for a reason. It creates a fascinating world lived entirely through an online universe known as Oz. It is made abundantly clear that Oz is not just some second life or social media haven. It is the means by which people live their lives. It's used by governments around the world to streamline infrastructure and trade. It is a system that has become fundamental to life and that point cannot be overstated. Enter Love Machine, a learning AI created and then jettisoned by the US military that finds its way into Oz and sets out to wreak havoc and make the world its bitch. 
This film has a deep human side to it as well, with a big family coming together and joining as one to face down this gargantuan threat that faces them as much as anyone else. There's also a subdued love story to add extra heart and soul to the mix, some math geekery for flavor, and a deluge of visual flair and creativity. It's extremely difficult to underplay the amazing originality of this film. <laughs> Elephant in the room. <laughs> uh, yes, much like Kill a Kill is to Gurren Lagann, Mamoru Hosoda took the base premise of his first major film and expanded upon it greatly to explore even deeper themes. And to be honest, I don't have any problem with this whatsoever. It's not some other director aping off the success of Digimon, it's the same guy remaking his own movie and doing an excellent job of it. Exactly. It's difficult to fully capture the awesomeness of Summer Wars in a description that doesn't dig deep into spoiler territory, so we'll have to leave it at this. Watch this movie, have a blast, and then watch it again! You'll never be so invested in a card game being played to decide the fate of the world. W no Fuck off! Number 6. Perfect Blue. Yep, it's Satoshi Kon time again. Much like we focused on Mr. Hosoda's earlier career. Hosoda? Anyway, it seems like the late Mr. Kon also did his most potent work back at the beginning of his career. And there's no better example than the disturbing, dark descent of a... pop singer? Yeah, this one's a little weird. Actually, it's a lot weird. Mm -hmm. But that's what makes it so great. The story begins with Mima Kirigoe, the leader of an extremely popular J-Idol group, Cham. At the height of her notoriety, she decides to take a dramatic career choice and move into acting. However, when a mysterious stalker and a betrayed fanbase lash out at her, she slowly starts to lose her sanity as the surreal world she never expected and the fiction of her unexpectedly sleazy new film career start gradually becoming indistinguishable. Perfect Blue is, without a doubt, Satoshi Kon's darkest work. There's a particularly graphic scene that starts out as a fictional sex sequence, but then transforms and becomes a very real rape, at least from the main character's perspective. It's very rare to see psychological pain in such a stark, cruel way, and I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. It's not just the main character either, you will also lose track of what's real and what's written as the film races towards its shocking conclusion, and it takes incredible directing talent to pull off something like that. When you have no idea if each and every scene of the final act is real, staged, or maybe even imagined, a true horror starts to sweep over you. Has Mima completely lost it? Is there any chance of her returning to reality? Is the film even in reality right now? Where's David Lynch's grounded return to reality when I need it? I truly believe this film is the zenith of Satoshi Kon's silver screen career, and you owe it to yourself to not look away for even a second. If you have seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Don't expect to walk away from this one unscathed. Number 5 the Disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya Man, for someone who said you'd never watch this shit, it seems like you can't get enough of it. Eh, well, <laughs> dealing with your wife who is turning out to be a real summer chore. Ignoring you now. Earlier on in this video, we talked about how Cowboy Bebop the movie excellently extended the series by pretty much doing more of the same. Well, needless to say, a movie that does something completely different and still does an excellent job of complementing its source material deserves a lot more credit. Like the Eden of the East movies? Shut the fuck up. The disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya begins on the eve of the SOS Brigade's Christmas party with all preparations completed. Kyon and Haruhi part happily as everybody looks forward to a wonderful holiday season, but when Kion awakens the next morning, he finds himself in a completely different reality. There is no SOS Brigade, and Haruhi Suzumiya simply does not exist. Well, not in his life, anyway. 
Unlike the two anime series before it, which focused largely on light-hearted comedic episodes, Disappearance is a completely straight, serious drama. Sure, there are moments of comedy relief, as you would expect, but the true focus is the mystery of Haruhi's disappearance, fittingly, and Kyon's quest to get back what he only now realizes matters most to him. Unlike many films with a human focus, the challenge Kion faces does seem to be an impossible one. How is he supposed to rewrite the entire world? Well, the answer is extremely spoilerific, so much like the rest of this list, our summary stops there. This is also the most substantial film on this list, clocking in at a massive 2 hours and 42 minutes. It's almost an entire third season of the show. But this film deserves its reputation as the numerous twists and turns remain clever and unpredictable, keeping you guessing all the way through its mammoth runtime. It never becomes boring or feels padded, not even a little. The only barrier to this film will be the learning curve as you need to at least have some familiarity with the series to follow what's going on. However, you could easily watch the first handful of Melancholy's episodes and be fully prepped. Give it a shot, and if you already have, Good for you. You know exactly what we're talking about. High five. Well, it sure did take us a long time to get to Miyazaki, but can you really blame us? I mean, would you actually have been happy if he was any lower on this list? No, I would have told you to kill yourself. Right. And I would have called you a faggot. Mm -hmm. And I would have downvoted you. Exactly. So let's start off this two-film celebration with some of... Wait, what did you say to me? Spirited Away! Yep. That's the one. Spirited Away, Hayao Miyazaki's first attempt at a final film, is by far his most critically acclaimed and creative film to date. The level of imagination in this film is almost superhuman. In a world of fantastical creatures, no two of them are alike. Each of the dozens of different beings we encounter is uniquely bizarre and awesome in its own way, and your jaw will drop at how often the film continues to surprise you. It's not common to see a world of pure fantasy work to 100% perfection when it's this far out there, but we're talking about the master of animation here. If you somehow haven't seen this film by this point in your anime career, you are just as rare as the creatures in this world, and you need to remedy this error yesterday. If I showed you nothing but still images from here on out, you would recognize each and every one of them instantaneously due to how prolific this film is. It was so great that it became the highest grossing anime film worldwide, which stood for 15 years until... Honestly, I didn't expect this one at all. I mean, as I've made clear in the past, I have no vested interest in puffing up Makoto Shinkai's work. If anything, people calling him the next Miyazaki made me even more critical of him. But there's no denying it. Your name is one of the all-time greatest anime films. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. There's no denying it. I don't have anything to add. All right, so review over then? Wait, On to the next. You jackass, come on, we gotta do something. Well, I mean, I don't really have any footage to use, so... Oh, uh, find something! I'm gonna talk. Oh. Your Name tells the story of two high school students, Mitsuha and Taki, who suddenly start switching bodies and experiencing each other's disparate lives. Eventually, they must come together to stop a tragedy and ensure their future. That's it. That's all I'm going to say about the plot. I mean, the film's animation and art are on a breathtaking level of gorgeous quality, and the attention to detail in the storytelling is fantastic to an extent that we have not seen an anime in quite some time. 
The excellent, incredible news is that Funimation will be releasing your name in American theaters on April 7th, so it won't be just us lucky few that get to see it, it will be everyone. The film has already broken the worldwide anime box office record previously held by Spirited Away, and it has only played in one theater here in the States. I cannot wait to see the greater success of this one-of-a-kind, must-see instant classic, and you shouldn't either. The only reason that this sits at number three on our list is because the remaining two films have history behind them. They both represent true groundbreaking landmarks in anime history, something that we can't quite attribute to your name. Not yet, at least. But regardless, this film is incredible. I don't even have a single bad thing to say about it. 10 out of 10. Jesus, April 7th can't come fast enough. Princess Mononoke is better than Spirited Away? What a shitlord! You know what I'm gonna call this entry? Your shame! Can I talk about the greatest Ghibli film of all time now? Yeah, sure, go for it. You know, Spirited Away may have earned Miyazaki the most awards and accolades worldwide, but there was a far greater project that he initially saw as his legitimate life's work, and it came years before Spirited Away, in a time when no film had ever done anything on its level. I'm talking about the grand, sweeping epic known as Princess Mononoke. Shitlord. Actually, Describing this film is extremely difficult because it's almost impossible to nail everything down in such a short span of time. But I guess I'll give it my best shot. Princess Mononoke centers around Ashitaka, the last prince of an ailing province who is corrupted by a curse during a fight with a demon god who attempts to destroy a town. He heads off to have the curse healed where he encounters San, the titular princess of the Great Spirit Wolves. The greatest thing about this film, as also described by Roger Ebert, is its morally ambivalent treatment of the war between nature and industry currently at hand. Lady Eboshi, the leader of Iron Town, wants to wipe out the forest creatures with her war machines, but she has justifiable cause to do so. The spirits are constantly attacking her town, and many of her people have been afflicted by the curse, which has doomed them to death. On the other side, the forest spirits not afflicted by the curse are defending themselves against this threat even while slowly becoming consumed by the curse and slowly looking more and more like an unjustifiable danger, at least from a certain perspective. The film doesn't tell you who is right and who is wrong because neither side is. The forest spirits are right in that those of them not cursed are innocent, but they're also wrong in saying that they have to attack the humans to defend themselves in general because they only feed Lady Eboshi's justifications. On the flip side, Lady Eboshi is entirely justified in advancing her troops to wipe out the threat that cursed spirits present to her people, but she's also wrong for trying to wipe out all of nature along with them. The case presented is an extremely complex, mature one, where you can entirely understand and sympathize with everyone involved in the situation, even when you disagree with most of them. And that's what war is. Miyazaki is known for being outspokenly anti-war, so it's shocking and refreshing to see such an objective, self-removed treatment of the subject from someone like himself. And it bears all his creativity and animation mastery on a scale that none of his films before or since have managed to match with such universal aptitude. I might personally prefer Spirited Away myself, but there's no denying the greatness of this film. It set a brand new standard for what could be accomplished in an anime film long before anyone else took up the cause. It is excellence in every facet and definitely worthy of the number two spot. Now, hmm, if only there were a more important and excellent anime film that even more dramatically changed the history of anime films forever. Hmm. 
and the number one anime film you must see is... Whatever, honorable mentions, deal with it. Yeah, yeah, we get it. We'll make these real quick. But we do have a whole bunch of films that didn't quite make it into the numbers that still have genuine greatness in them that you have to know about. Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust. Just like the first D film, it's bloody and awesome with better animation, better fights, and much higher art quality overall. <laughs> and who wouldn't want to come back for more of the D? Steam Boy. On a purely artistic level, it's a masterpiece. However, avoid the English dub as it becomes insanely pretentious and preachy around the halfway point and never lets up, becoming wildly unbearable near the end. Gundam Wing Endless Waltz. A great way to cap off the Gundam Wing series, Endless Waltz brings you everything best about giant robots fighting in space. The Boy and the Beast and Wolf Children. Both of these were unfortunately cut from the list due to our two film maximum, but both are excellent entries from Mamoru Hosoda's collection. Definitely seek them out. Robot Carnival and Memories. Like Neo Tokyo, these are anthology films with their own unique focuses and excellent artistry. If you can, check them out. Paprika. It's Satoshi Kon's most abstract, bizarre film, but it still puts his talents on full display in just as striking fashion as ever. And finally, in case we weren't clear about it, every other Miyazaki film! Seriously, they're all awesome. Watch them now, and then watch them again. Well, it's finally time, JT. The number one anime film that everybody's just gotta run out and see. I mean, you know that no matter what you pick, people are just gonna be pissed off at you, right? Oh, well, yeah, of course. I mean, this is the internet. When has any number one choice not resulted in whiny ridicule? Exactly. So let's finally get right to it. This is the number one anime that you must see. history of Western anime, there is no anime film more important than Akira. There is no film that changed the game on a worldwide scale in a more dramatic way than Akira. No film that proved more shockingly that this animation shit isn't just for kids. This is Akira, and it is the greatest anime film of all time. I mean, I don't know if I... Of all time! I before it even got here in the West, Akira set a stunning standard for anime in Japan. It was the first anime production in history to introduce pre-scored dialogue where all the film's lines were recorded by the voice actors first, and then the mouth movements were animated to match them. It also achieved a never-before-seen quality of fluid animation in anime with over 160,000 hand-drawn frames, setting an uncommonly high budget of 1.1 billion yen. For 1989, this was no ordinary production. The original manga author, Katsuhiro Otomo, threw himself into the project and compiled over 2,000 pages of notes on various ideas and character designs, ultimately contributing 738 of them. Never before had an original author been so invested in an anime project based on his original work, which still hadn't been completed. We've talked about the ultra-violence and gore that typified so much 90s anime, but how do you think that became so popular and mainstream? Akira, that's how. Once Pioneer brokered a wide US theatrical release for their English dub in 2001, it defined the American anime community, creating a wider interest in anime films and paving the way for Spirited Away's win at the next Oscars. To say that this film changed anime everywhere is an understatement. The anime community in this country would not be what it is today without this film. 
I've actually run into a fair amount of anime fans recently that haven't seen Akira, and several of them look down on it as some relic from another time. Well guess what? Your name wouldn't be set for a wide theatrical release this year without Akira, because if Pioneer hadn't released Akira, they never would have become successful enough to merge into Pioneer Genion. And if Pioneer Genion didn't thrive on dubbing anime, there wouldn't have been a significant enough market for Funimation to start up. And if Funimation doesn't exist, no Your Name American release. Game fucking over. As JT said, the importance and relevance of this film cannot be overstated. However, the film is excellent simply on its own merits. It's a fantastically dark dystopian fantasy with so much disturbing creativity and emotion that it demands to be taken seriously. And if you don't take it seriously, you're probably a pretentious cunt who needs to learn a thing or two. Seriously, watch this film now, even if you already have. Witness the history that paved the way for your fandom today and wow at how amazing it was and still is. Well, that brings our Top 25 Trilogy to a close. We'll definitely be doing more lists like this, but not 25. 25 is a big number, and it was really hard just coming up with these three lists. So if you've got any ideas for lists you'd like to see us do down the line, send them to anamericatheshow at gmail.com. And if you've got any films on your Top 25 that we didn't include, let us know about them in the comments below. Until next time, I'm Will Ryan. And I'm JT Camp, reminding you kind folks at home, don't be pretentious cunts. Mm -mm. We're not perfect, and neither are you. Exactly. Stay skeptical, everyone. <laughs>